They said you were the best in the Parsec. Welcome to Parsec Passion, a podcast about Star Wars TV shows on Disney+. Plus. My name's Bubba, and with me, as always, is somebody who finally, finally actually did something with the Force. It's Matt. Matt, how you doing? I'm great, but you can call me Ahsoka the Walter White because I'm about to become a criminal when we talk about this episode. We'll get to it. We'll get to it. But I I just wanted to say I'm happy to be here. I apologize to all of the Parsec Passion fandom that we could not get this strike resolved so that Catfish could return for at least one episode. I was so hoping when the writer's strike happened or was getting resolved that the actor's strike might follow suit quickly. Turns out that wasn't the case, so you're stuck with me for this whole season. And believe me, I honor you for sticking with me. Matt, I had no idea that this show, I mean, I guess I should have known, how heavily it would lean into the its animated origins. And without you, we would have been in trouble. So it's sad Catfish isn't here, but even if Catfish had been here, we would have needed you. Folks, we're going to be covering Ahsoka Part 8, The Jedi, The Witch, and The Warlord. A.K.A. Shin's not the only one who got punked by this finale. No, Shin. Oh, my goodness gracious. We'll talk about her in a second. The cut line for this episode is the hero's race to prevent Grand Admiral Thrawn's escape. Matt, let's get to it. You have have kind of wavered. You've had some episodes you've absolutely loved and some you've been a bit down on. What is your rating for the finale, episode eight? I know that my ratings tend to be inconsistent with everybody else's and that you might you know, at best, questionably call it a method. Uh, (laughs) Definitely not a system or anything resembling a process. No. But I am only going to give this 8.3 out of 10, what I like to call double Bs. Double Bs? Balin busts. Because either in the fact that we only got one scene from him or the (laughs) fact that he was standing on a statue, either way, it's a bust. This really left me with a bad taste in my mouth. The fact that They built this up. They built this up. I can respect Filoni playing a long run. He had no idea what would happen to Ray Stevenson. Nobody did. But this seems like to give us more than just Balon looking out from one of the Argonauts over Mordor, you know, just give us something that gave us a clue as to what was going on there. And maybe you can say that the, the identities of the statues helped a little bit, but I did think that there were some nice character resolutions between Ahsoka and Sabine. Yes. Um, I love the fact that Ezra did get home. There were lots of things to really like about this episode, Mm -hmm. but it does seem kind of a waste just to have Ezra and our two main characters just switch places. They're separated again. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so we're right back where we started. It's just, you know, the different people are on the other ends of the spectrum. And I'm not sure that I like that. We've got Thrawn into the universe now he wasn't nearly as uh, I, I was expecting at least one scene where we saw thrawn's true militaristic prowess as a naval commander i expected them to come back to Peridi or to Cetos and there mm-hmm. to be uh, like a rebel fleet waiting for him because now hera had put the word out it had gotten to mon mothma uh, and i was expecting thrawn to do something really big there didn't get any of that just not a single clue as to what Balin's looking for. And as far as sword stuff and, and lightsaber stuff, I mean, yes, I'm a fan because I'm a star Wars fan. You better Um, be. Yeah. (laughs) And this definitely was faster and more intense the way George Lucas would have wanted it. This one between Morgan and Ahsoka, but there there were just so many things that don't normally grab my attention. Normally I know Bubba, you're a big action guy. I'm not a big action guy. And this was a big action episode. I, should have held on to my zombie theory for just a little bit longer, I suppose, <laughs> uh, it, instead of totally dismissing it last week to where now I'm just kind of like, well, I thought of that two episodes ago and and see, I was right. I can't say that because I completely shut it down last week. Uh, that's because that's the kind of integrity that I have. Again, I really loved the music. Kiner did an act absolutely Great job. I'm not a big fan of the whole samurai theme stuff, but that's okay. It's his show. He can do it the way he wants. I think it's well done, whatever it is. 
Um, but that's really what kind of saved my episode from maybe dipping below an eight because well, I was bouncing back and forth between the scenes going, oh, that's cool. And then going, why? Just why? And I've no, I've griped and gr- grumbled and, and done all that enough. So Bubba, why don't you give everybody your rating for this particular episode? Man, oh man, oh man. I feel bad that I haven't come up with a double yet. So let's see. I'll do double B's, bail and bus. Okay, sure. So I'm going to rate this. Well, you were afraid of going below an eight. You have a different, slightly different scale than maybe others. On my scale, I am going to give this eight double B's out of 10. Double B's? Matt, you just said it. It was bail and bus. I just said oh. it. Like literally, I decided to use the same scale as you did because I didn't come up with a double. I've been working too hard. I apologize. It's so fascinating that you're talking about action. Uh, Let me have a little preamble here. When Morgan and Ahsoka fought in The Mandalorian Season 2, I didn't really think that was the greatest action fight ever. I kind of thought it was okay. I was actually kind of not engaged with it. That describes how I felt with this episode. I wasn't really grabbed by it until the Morgan and Ahsoka epic sword fight. Mm -hmm. I thought it was great. I thought it was incredible. I thought... You know, I know this happens sometimes in in what we here in America would call maybe these uh, martial arts films. I would have been fine if this whole episode had been this fight. That's how beautiful it was. That's how much I love the choreography. That's how engrossed I was in Ahsoka versus Morgan round two. And so I was into it. Once again, I wasn't too pulled into the episode before they started fighting. And there are just two things that as a storyteller, it did that I don't like. This season ends on a bunch of, like, what's going to happen? Ahsoka and Sabine are trapped in a different galaxy. They don't have a way to get back. What's going to happen? Like, that's a that's a cliffhanger. That's a question. I think that's understandable. It's like, okay, the story ended up this way, and we knew they would have to get back somehow, but now, like, without the Eye of Scion, it's like, okay, they don't really have a way. That type of question leaving on, I think that's fine. But when you have questions for several episodes— that you don't bother to answer in this season, meaning Balin was always like, I'm looking for this great power. I'm looking for this great power. And he was talking about that, what, since episode one, maybe episode two? And here we are at episode eight being done, and we still don't have any clue to specifically what he was looking for. I hate that type of trick in storytelling. Similarly, we saw the infamous it's going to take me three days to pack Thrawn. Like, okay, I got to move these cargo in one at a time. I've joked about it in other episodes. And it's like, okay, he's moving this special cargo. He's moving this special cargo. And that special cargo is, we still don't know. We may have some ideas, but we still don't know. And those type of things that happen on other shows, they annoy me in other shows too. And it annoyed me in this show. So it had an incredible high But for not answering some of the questions it's been posing to us, it's been posing these questions to us. Like I said, this is what Balin's goal is. What does he want to do? It's been posing that possibly since as early as episode one or two. And to not answer that, incredibly frustrating. High highs, low lows, and a little stuff in between. Matt, that's my rating. It kind of feels like I'm a bit like your rating, but maybe my high might be a bit higher than yours. But we're both kind of the same. That This is an odd place we're going to be left hanging on for about two years. What do you think of the fact that we're so similar? A uh, animated show watcher like you and a non-animated show watcher like me. I would like to consider, actually, Bubba, if we have a second, I would like to consider about the whole season because I think that's where okay. the difference in our reflections sure. would be. All right. You as a non-animation uh, animation investor – Let's so to say you've watched some episodes, you've learned right. things about some episodes, but you haven't really buried yourself into it. Correct. I would imagine that your overall takeaway of this season is probably less positive. Not that it's not positive, but less positive than mine, because I got so many fan services throughout right. the course of, of mm-hmm. this season that yeah. really pleased me. And I'm sure that that, and a lot of them may have meant nothing to you at all, even <laughs> after me trying to explain some of them. Right. Like maybe in the, the, in this episode itself, the infamous, what I want to call the force owl, I don't know its name, but that creature that looks like an owl that seems to show up and almost be an embodiment of the force. Like 
I kind of know it because I understand it showed up on the animated shows and might have shown up in the Mandalorian season two. But for me, it was like, oh, it's one of those things. I didn't have a real emotional tie to it. So, yeah, See, I think that for almost me, that's descri- a big one because that's there you Mirai. Go. That's the daughter that saved Ahsoka's life the first time around and has been oh, with wow. her the whole time. See, Wait, it that's is? That's the difference between you and me because. Oh, wow. I, I in that episode, and we'll get more into this later in the episode, but there mm-hmm. are figures here, some of which I'm sure you could identify, but I can tell you, I think we've even talked about it earlier in this season, but there's a whole story behind the father, the son, and the and the daughter's involvement right. in Ahsoka's story from Clone Wars and from Rebels. So that's one of those things that really got me. Okay. But you, you were just kind of like, oh yeah, that owl's back. <laughs> that's right i was yeah that those are the kinds of things where i'd say that i probably came away from this season with a lot more nuggets and a lot of more fun i thought that the season overall was fantastic i in fact oh, this is the first episode that i've really been disappointed in, mm. in in fact and probably due to my own expectations as often happens with me i set my expectations so high for something that i you know nothing could possibly meet them Mm-hmm. But yeah, I I mean, overall, I would have given the season overall at least an 8.9 to 9 out of 10. Yeah, see, I, I loved last week as we talked about it. it seemed like a lot of fun adventure and action and the characters weren't stoic and moping so or sluggish. So I, I really was high on last week. I would give the overall season a B. Like I said, last week was such a high because it felt like it was trying to pull me along with the fun. And, and um, I was willing to go along with the fun in this week was about a B. I'd say the whole season is a B. So, you know, an eight is probably what I'd say. Eight out of ten. Guys, what but, did you think of this episode? Uh, what did you think of this season? Please, you must let us know because nobody really cares what Ahsoka the Walter White thinks, but they might care what you think. And so please send out the word to us on social medias, add the word double, the letters P-H-Q. That's double podcast headquarters uh, on the social medias like X Twitter, like Instagram, like threads, Mm -hmm. like Facebook, facebook facebook.com slash the word double, the letters P-H-Q. You can also leave comments on our YouTubes. We love getting involvement from our YouTubes. Please hit that like button. Please hit that subscribe button. And don't forget to hit that notifications bell, yo, just like John McGonagall tells us. To do so, uh, we must always say yo so that the young people will know that we're talking to them and they'll hit that uh, notification bell. YouTube.com slash at the word double the letters P, the letter, the I'm sorry, at the word double the letter P, <laughs> yeah. the word media. Woo! Ooh, I'll twist. get it one of these days. Ahsoka the Walter White. This is making me think that Ezra is the Jesse Pinkman of this show. And so let's go. Hey, I've got a couple of questions based on this episode and this season that I thought I should ask. And I want to go with the title of episode eight, Matt. This episode is titled The Jedi, the Witch and the War Lord. To me, that is obviously a play on C.S. Lewis's novel, The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. I I've read that book when I was a kid. I have seen that movie that they made maybe about 20 years ago. And uh, I don't immediately see any direct correlations between this and that this story and the Lion and the Witch in the Wardrobe story, except maybe it's always traveling between worlds in Lion, the Witch mm-hmm. in the Wardrobe. Spoiler for the first chapter is between our world and Narnia here on Ahsoka, it's traveling between the two gar- galaxies. Did you see any parallels between Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe or any other stories to the story we're seeing with Ahsoka? Well, first of all, Bubba, I just love that you are so particular that you give a spoiler alert for a book that is 80 years old. Secondly, I don't think I did see a single thing. Yeah, I, I've I read all so of either. the Chronicles of Narnia. I there I found more parallels between uh, it and the Lord of the Rings. To be perfectly Ooh. honest, you got Ahsoka okay. and Ezra and Sabine riding wargs. Um, you've got Balin standing on an Argonoth, like I said before, and he's overlooking <laughs> Mordor. Sure, uh, I would call the Night Troopers basically orcs and the Death Troopers that they faced last. Those two, Urukai. It, okay. it just uh, and the only kind of parallel at all is you might call Morgan, you know, the White Witch. 
Ooh, and that's the yeah. only that's the only comparison I think I could do. But I think the real reason why they did this, Bubba, is because the title was supposed to imply, yes, there are an awful lot of fantasy elements in Star Wars, especially in the animation stuff that that hadn't been brought into the live action canon as of yet. And this is your introduction into that, just like Lion, Witch in the Wardrobe was your introduction into Narnia. Matt, that is so educated and so smart. Now I know why people. Right. I, I will. I was going to say now I know why people might miss catfish. We never try to be this smart on the, on our podcast. They're like, what is somebody taking me to school? That's too smart. No, Matt, I think that's a great point. Star Wars was always space fantasy, space opera. You're right with witches and magical worlds and um, flat out magic. Sure, this is becoming way more fantasy. This is we're putting a little willow into our Star Wars, but I think that's fine. Listeners, what do you think? Also, I want to know uh, my second question of the week is really for you, listeners. This show, to me, as a non initiated, as Matt just called me in the animated stuff, if you're if you weren't watching the animated shows, I need to know your thoughts on Ahsoka. Are you like me? Were you like, It's good, but I can't really get a lot out of it. Hey, if you're an animated show watcher like Matt, did you see this owl and suddenly think, yeah, that's the daughter. I'm still kind of blown away by this. The owl is the daughter of the kind of forced trinity of father, son, and daughter. Okay, wow. Okay. Spoilers for the animated show. Spoilers. Yeah, sorry, folks. (laughs) Everybody, if you are listening to this on our audio podcast, our Parsec Passion podcast feed, Know that when we talk about the shows we're doing, they're on separate audio podcast feeds. So, for example, if you want to hear us talk about a true fantasy show, a fantasy show which just is finishing up its second season, The Wheel of Time on Amazon Prime, you need to go to your podcast app and search for the audio podcast feed called Bustin' Blockbusters. That's Bustin' without the G, Bustin' Blockbusters. And you'll hear Matt and I and our good friend Priscilla talk up a great second season of The Wheel of Time fantasy show. If you hear me talk about these comedy murder mysteries we've been covering, you need to go to your podcast app of choice and search for Double P Podcast. That's just the letter P for podcast, so it's Double P Podcast. Search for that, and you'll hear me and sometimes uh, Double M and sometimes Catfish and others talking about crazy shows. In this case, we are just finishing up the comedy murder mystery, Only Murders in the Building. Now, guys, it is time to dive into this season finale. I know there was a bit of a dust up online because either the Instagram or Twitter account tweeted out, are you ready for the Ahsoka series finale? And people were like freaking out, wait, series finale? No, we can, even though there's been no official announcement, we are going to treat this as a season finale. And let's get into it. Matt, I know you've got a great musical analysis section coming up, which almost deals a bit more with the end credits. Did you have any thoughts on these opening kind of music that brought us into the episode where it felt like battle drums, rolling drums, getting us ready for the approaching storm? And that was the exact intent. It it was to represent the approaching storm, the, the tension that is hanging thick in the air of Peridia as our heroes try to get to Thrawn and Thrawn tries to keep them from getting to him. So I love that particular kind of setup. It works. It wouldn't have been my choice. I would mm. have preferred a dissonant chord over the rolling drums, but that's just oh, I me. See. Okay. That's just me. That and, well, this, Matt, and obviously is, he's got a lot more work scoring film than I do. So. Matt, we need to get you out there. We need you out there uh, scoring some film for us so we can hear some of these thoughts you have. Maybe the rolling drums weren't to get us ready for battles, but to celebrate the dang packing is finally done. Like, (laughs) finally, we've had three episodes of packing. I've been waiting to get off this planet of Peridia for nine years. Oh, you're ready to go now? Well, it's going to take three days to pack. Oh, my Lord. Thank goodness. Captain Enoch, who, as you mentioned and shocked me, is played by an incredible actor from The Expanse. We went this whole season without ever seeing his face. Maybe there's a mystery of what his face is like. And to me, his voice even seemed more modulated. What did you think of Captain, I don't do much except oversee the packing Enoch? (laughs) I just follow orders. That's why I'm here. 
I would imagine just to go into theory land right away is that there isn't much of the actual Enoch there anymore. Although he's not wearing any of the garment, any of the sister garments Mm -hmm. that I could see. So maybe that's not the case. Maybe something happened to him and he's just basically kind of a Darth Vader type. He's more machine than man, at least from the chest up. So that, that could be the case as well. Uh, it is an absolute crime not to see Wes Chatham's face, though. So, yeah, uh, what's going I'm on? Sh- I'm sure that uh, many people who have drooled over Wes Chatham in The Expanse uh, were quite disappointed that they just got another Captain Phasma, except with the gold face instead right. of the silver one. He and know. Phasma should should go out sometime. They, they should, should be like they matched together on, a, on an app. Up. Yeah. <laughs> now, Thrawn, he is very much... It didn't... It, really hit me until this episode. I've read those original Timothy Zahn Thrawn novels. I've, you know, seen a bit of him in the animated shows, but it was in this episode where I finally put it together. Thrawn is a Bond villain. If you watch James Bond movies, there isn't, the movies don't normally end with like an action scene between Bond and the villain. Like they don't get into a fist fight normally. The Bond villain normally has henchmen who the hero James Bond fights. And the Bond villain is like the thinking man. And at the beginning of this episode, I finally put it together. Thrawn really has done nothing except I'm going to stand here and talk and give this order. And then I'm going to stand over here and talk and give this order. He's not a man of action at all. He's a man of saying people go do action, but he doesn't really. But a bit like a Bond villain, they better Bond villain knows their opponent and says, okay, James Bond is tough. We, we got a plan for this. Thrawn gives the Jedi their due. He's like, I've faced them before. I've kind of uh, fallen victim like others have to underestimating the Jedi. And so they're tough. Let's do it. And then the great mothers come up to Morgan Elsbeth and uh, who they point out, Morgan, you're the one who heard our, our dreams from across the stars. They say, Morgan, come forward. And I've seen enough entertainment in my life to be like, Morgan, are you sure you want to step forward? <laughs> and the great witch is, they say, listen, you shall be rewarded. The gift of shadows. Do you abandon your old life for the new one? Morgan, my life, my loyalty. And then if this has happened on the animated show, I'm glad I didn't know about it. Because, oh, snap, the way I described it is like they burn their stuff into her, into her face. Oh, my God. Dang, Matt, did they do that on the animated show? That was hardcore. Yeah, there was a very similar ritual done to Asajj Ventress. Oh, no, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah is, that character, right. You know that character from the Clone Wars? It was mm-hmm. very similar to that. And even the sword that oh, really? Morgan was presented with. It's called either the Sword of Talzin or the Blade of Talzin. I've heard it called both. Mm-hmm. Um, it was also used in a, in a Clone Wars episode where one of the Night Sisters, I uh, I guess it was Mother Talzin actually uh, summoned it just like the same way that these sisters summoned it. And wow. she used it to fight Mace Wins- Windu during the mm. Clone Wars, a- a- an episode on that. So I think it was called Disappeared Part 2, if you want to check that out. Dang, um, I, I, I was tough on this episode. I said it didn't really grab me. But this moment, hey, we're going to, you know, we're going to burn our faith in our almost our powers into you and you will have these scars for the rest of your life. Holy smokes. That did grab me. That was powerful. And as somebody who watched game of Thrones, seeing a flaming sword, I thought, boy, Stannis is going to be really jealous. (laughs) Well, I'm I'm glad that you found it that great because all I was doing was sitting there looking at my watch going, this is taking way too long. How are we going to get Balin in there? How are we going to do all of this? Well, that's a great question because they kind of didn't really get Balin or Shin into this. Yeah, well, it should have been a hint to me at the time that they weren't going to get to much of that Mm -hmm. at all uh, by the amount of time they spent on this. Granted, it is important. It's great stuff that brings in some of the lore from the animated series. It obviously grabbed you. It grabbed me too. I loved seeing it in live action, mm-hmm. but I was uh, I was keeping my eye on the clock. It's not that I was bored. I was just thinking about all of my expectations and how there were now only thirty six minutes left to complete them. So oh, yeah, I've been there with you in watching some of these shows, being like, okay, we got to get moving. Let me ask you this, and maybe this isn't uh, true of the animated show, but watching this ritual, watching all the things that are happening, 
and they would occasionally, naturally, cut to Thrawn for like a reaction shot. There was one where it made me think, does Thrawn think all this is kind of like insanity and nothingness? Like, I wasn't sure if he was watching it going, oh, this is great, these powers are really going to help me, or if the react one of these reaction shots was, okay, let's get this over with. Well, you know, I got serious things to do. So, yeah. Do, do they go into that in the animated show? And if they don't, what did you think of Thrawn during all this uh, long uh, blade of towels in ceremony? Well, I actually enjoyed that because I saw him assessing it is the mm. way that I saw okay. it more so okay. than him reacting to what was happening. You and I both know uh, from Timothy Zahn's books and you it's well demonstrated in, in the Rebel series as well that he is a connoisseur of culture and will use all of that culture in order to find the best method. And he may even be at that moment thinking about, okay, I know there's a point where I'm going to have to use these people and I'm going to have to find a way to beat them. You know, so he may be checking all this out, simply thinking of the future. Once again, Matt, stop being so intelligent. I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I read it it, once again, it, it was only really one shot where it was like Thrawn was thinking, Gosh, three days to pack, now 15 minutes to get the sword, let's go. But yeah. meanwhile, our heroes, the good guys, they're traveling together with the Nodi. The Nodi ships, even though I love them, they are moving slow, let's be honest. And so we've got time for Ezra to build his own saber. So we've got Ahsoka with hers, obviously, her kind of twin blades. We've got Sabine with the blade she had, which I assume was Ezra's old one, right? And now Ezra's building a new one. Hu Yang is, is doing, for the only way I can describe it uh, for a family podcast, is Hu Yang was looking at Ezra like, be please. I taught your master how to build a lightsaber. Listen to me. I'll teach you how to build it, you bum. <laughs> and then Sabine. Get off my lawn. Right, right. Okay. Listen, I've been doing this since before you were born, before your parents were born, since before your civilization was formed. I've been doing this. Listen to me how to do it. Now, Sabine is in the doorway. And once again, I haven't watched the animated show. And I think there's a chance this wasn't covered in the animated show. But it seems quite obvious that Ahsoka didn't teach her how to build a lightsaber. Doesn't that seem kind of clear? Yes, I agree. Uh, in fact, that's that's kind of like, you know, because she vacates the premises. Let me just stop for a second and say that the call out to Kanan Jarrus Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that uh, Hu Yang actually had the part and had kept the part, I loved that. And I oh, love that he called Kanan uh, Caleb because that was yeah. his real name. So I, I oh, love really? that. But man, all of this was a long way to go to have Ezra build a lightsaber. And again, I'm just watching my watch. And to just understand the, the end of it is important. We find out that. The reason Ahsoka probably didn't go that far with Sabine is because she was worried that she would use any kind of force powers Mm -hmm. to avenge what happened on Mandalore. So she was worried that it would, uh, you know, attachment would once again turn to the dark side, as she had seen with her master. So you so nobody knew that, right? That wasn't this specific part of it wasn't in an animated show. No, no. the, the, The rebels closed before Mandalore happened. Oh, okay. The tragedy so, on Mandalore, yeah, the night the of a thousand on tears, Mandalore. right? Yeah. Well, then, then this gets this makes me think of something that I put in the notes. They should have shown this earlier. They should have told us this earlier. Mm. Like if they could have afforded to do a flashback to it, they should have done that. Or at the very least, they should have told us this earlier because to me, it was a very important piece of information that. Here I'm only finding out in episode eight. It's like, oh, okay. Oh, in but, other words, Filoni's going to tell you. Well, see, I'm giving you answers. You've been asking this question, even though Bubba oh, forgot well. the question about four episodes ago. Um, right? Yeah, I did. Let's be honest, I did. I, there's too much to yeah. keep track of. And let me also say that what I just said a second ago is like they're telling us instead of showing us. Yeah. Star Wars certainly. George Lucas was not a huge flashback fan. But when Ahsoka had that long whole episode of flashback dealing with Anakin in episode five, I think you could have shown this as a flashback of her saying, you know, Sabine, there's anger in your heart. Yada, yada. You know, you want revenge. I can't train. I I think that would have that would have been in a powerful scene that might have helped me and maybe others in those earlier episodes where we're just seeing a stoic person and a uh, frustrated person, butt heads and not 
you know, not really have uh, too much going on, I guess I would say, in the way of scene work. And then speaking of not much in the way of going on in scene work, there's a scene here that really made me appreciate the films even more. Ahsoka is talking to Sabine, her Padawan, for still for all intents and purposes, and she's telling her Padawan, you know, kind of J- Jedi-isms. Train your mind, train your body, trust in the Force. Normally, when a master or any Jedi is telling this to a student or Padawan, they're like doing something. Like I always think to Empire Strikes Back, Luke is, isn't he doing a headstand, handstand? Uh, and he's, you know, trying to lift rocks and, and Yoda's saying this stuff about train your mind, train your body, trust the force. And so like we see visual things of him like trying to trust the force and trying to lift the rock and try to do these things. And so just that active bit of it kind of makes that go through. Similarly, in The Last Jedi, we see Luke talking to Ray with these kind of mantras and it's almost played for laughs where Luke in the last Jedi rubs a leaf like across or a blade of grass across <laughs> Ray's hand. Yeah. That's great. And, and you see her country like there's something to it. Here, if I'm not mistaken, it's just two people standing. And there isn't like that third element of it where instead it's just Ahsoka saying, train your mind, train your body, trust in the force. And so to me, I didn't really enjoy this scene too much of them just standing on the top of this ship. But uh, I think you did. What did you think of the scene? I thought it was a really good scene. Not for that. I mean, I understand okay. how you can how you can have a complaint with that. Sure. But to me, the bigger part of that was Ahsoka assuring Sabine that she was taught to always stand by her Padawan and mm. that she would stand mm. by Sabine. This was essentially because they brought up the whole incident of how they got there in the first place. Right. Um, this was essentially Ahsoka saying, it's okay. Forgive yeah. yourself because yeah. I forgive you. And that was a big thing that we were kind of like, are they ever going to actually face this problem head on? They didn't do it in the way that I thought they would. I thought there might be some kind of at least a little bit of friction. But this way's better. It's the Jedi way. It's much more the Jedi way than it is to to scream and yell about it. <laughs> Yeah, be a what you're saying. Obi Wan's, uh, you know, negative reinforcement as a Jedi Master was it good? I I thought it was good, but we can't <laughs> we we can't stand and talk too long. We got to have the Tie Fighters attack. You know, Ahsoka's starship has been so been through so much, and it goes through uh, even more <laughs> in this episode. But the most important thing is Ahsoka and Ezra. They keep the ship up from crashing on the Nodi. At this point. To hell with either galaxy, save the Nodi, right? Like, we can't have that happen. Right. And, you know, and we were all so impressed in Empire Strikes Back when Yoda lifted just, you know, this light little X-Wing up out mm-hmm. of the swamp. Right. Uh, here these, I mean, a Jedi, a T-6 Jedi shuttle is much, much larger. <laughs> and uh, these guys are, are pulling their weight. I felt kind of bad for them because it's kind of like somebody's going to get a Force hernia in there somewhere. I think we needed Yoda to pull Luke's X-Wing out of the swamp, lift it up, pull it over, and then drop it on a Nodi village. <laughs> <laughs> You're um, so mean. I, I am a bit mean. All right. Sabine runs in the ship and we do have once again, another little action beat where Sabine uses what I guess is the last bit of kind of thruster power for uh, Ahsoka starship. And she flies it out and she pretty much pulls a hold though maneuver and smashes the two TIE fighters into away into dust. And Sabine says, got him. And to me, if this is my ship, I guess I've officially become the dad in all these shows. I'm like, wait, that you're trying to like be cocky and say you got him when you smashed my ship and to do Starship <laughs> style with you. That was what was funny because that was exactly Ahsoka's reaction after she yes. said got him. It was kind of like, do you have insurance for that? You right. Know, <laughs> who's who's gonna who's gonna pay the deductible on this, Sabine? Uh, so I right. love that. I thought that was hilarious. Their ship is, like I said, the, does this ship have a name? I feel bad. I keep calling it Ahsoka's ship. What's what's Does it have a name? You know what? I can't recall. Okay. Well, I'm it sorry. Probably, I'm a it bad probably Star has Wars a name. fan. Uh, no, no, it's hate okay. mail to at the word double, the letters PHQ. They don't, call, they don't mention it. You know, like the Millennium Falcon, everybody talks about. Where's the Falcon? I got to get to the Falcon. It's a Millennium Falcon, fastest ship. If Ahsoka's ship has a name, they need to mention it more often for me, a non-animated show. I guess it's Falcon. Fulcrum. 
right? Be- oh, really? Oh, okay. That makes that sense. That was from right. the first episode is mm-hmm. what they called it, I believe. So All right. Well, it is it is completely destroyed. These Noki, they're pretty smart, I guess, on Land Rovers, but we need them to help build a starship with Hu Yang. And so our heroes have to ride these Howlers to stop Thrawn. Yes. Ahsoka and Ezra, you know, they are double Ws. Double Ws? Yeah, well whispers. Oh, yeah, that's They can communicate with animals. So um, (laughs) it was pretty easy to just call up a couple of howlers, I guess, when there wasn't any around before then. Not not a single one that I saw. Uh, But all of a sudden, there's howlers there for their convenience to hop on. They can hop on their wargs and ride to Mordor or to uh, Mount Doom. All right, so Thrawn, he sees that, hey, they're coming, they're coming. And Thrawn's like, we're going to need ground forces. And then they're called volunteers. So we're not really sure what's going on with these stormtroopers who have been the really worn armor. They've got the red cloth constantly wrapped around their stuff. But they're volunteering to be the ground force to go take on these Jedi. And as I called them, oh, you need some cannon fodder? Yeah, okay, I'll do it. Whoa, (laughs) ouch. To which I replied, well, if we just wait around a couple more minutes, we'll see that that's not what they volunteered for. They volunteered to be resurrected, baby. Whoa. How do you, do you think one guy maybe survived and didn't have to be resurrected and all his friends have been resurrected? He's like, hey, wait, no, 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 hold on. I'm still alive. I think there is some kind of non-disclosure agreement that once you're in that group, you cannot possibly let anybody else know that you were still alive when that happened. Okay. Now, I'm only going to mention this. In the way that it works, I thought at times, and who's to say what a how what a what a Jedi riding a howler in Peridia while being hit by lasers from a star destroyer before they run into an ancient Night Sister temple? Who's to say what that really looks like? But at times, I noticed the effects, and I thought they yeah. certain effects weren't so great. And so this, to me, once again, goes to my engagement. If I'm really engaged with the show, I see an effect. I'm like, eh, whatever. The first season of The Mandalorian, I I pointed this out on our podcast. When IG-11 is driving through town, he shoots a stormtrooper, sure enough. The stormtrooper smashes into a wall, and you see the seam of the plywood wall split open. (laughs) Like, you see that in the the show. But because I'm so engaged, I don't, you know, I'm like, oh, okay, that's just like shows in the 80s would have that happen. Here... Because once again, I wasn't truly engaged until this uh, sword fight. I did notice some of these effects that made me go, yeah, yeah, I don't know. And this was one where the the three heroes are on these howlers. They're being blasted from above, and they're trying to use the force to open up the temple doors so they can get in. Yeah, I, I agree with you that uh, a little bit this of this. I mean, they're at the end of the season. Maybe they ran out of money. Um <laughs> like Lucasfilm ever runs out of money people Same but uh, maybe they just didn't want to spend anymore is more like oh, yeah. the, the thing so uh, I have always had problems with any of these aspects where you have live action that's being filmed on some type of blue or green mm-hmm. uh, screen and then it's replaced with animation and likely in this case also filmed on the volume that combination was a little bit lethal for the believability and not only that, but just the premise of it, because you know that they're going to get through it. So why are you invested in what's going to happen to them at all? It gives you a chance to notice some of that stuff. True. Okay. I like that. It, it, uh, you met you hundred percent. The one thing I did like about this little beat of the action is that when they get into the fortress, our actor portraying Thr- Thrawn, once again, he's covered in blue makeup He's got red contacts or red special effects for his eyes. And I'm sure the stage direction was, look peeved. <laughs> so he's like, oh, they got into the fortress. Look peeved. Excellent take, Mickelson. Great job. And so now it's time for our three heroes to take on in, take on the impossible force, to take on a giant battalion of night troopers. And this is a great way to show how powerful your heroes are. And so, again, it's good action. I didn't really get involved until a couple of beats later. Did you have any any thought about this just action beat of, okay, we're trapped in a room with a giant battalion of night troopers. What are we going to do? It's interesting because really in live action, I don't know how many times we've seen 
a Jedi take on a whole squadron of stormtroopers right. or yeah. anything like that. So that was interesting to me. Uh, the results, of course, were predictable. Oh, yes. Um, but I loved the way that uh, Thrawn had thought that through and uh, the Night Sisters had thought, or the Great Mothers, pardon me, had thought that through also. Well, the Great Mothers, they start, it's time to start doing some witch magic with a K and yeah. A great way to twist the typical scene. We've seen heroes battle stormtroopers a million times. How are we going to give it a, a twist? How are we going to yes and to that? Well, what we're going to do is via this magic, the troopers can't stay down. They take a licking. They keep on ticking. This is a Star Wars zombie attack. This, you know, hey, I'm down for it. Like the way this was staged was so smart. Our heroes would like literally knock a stormtrooper out they'd be down for pretty much a count of two Mississippi and then they'd stand back up and get in the fight. I, I, once again, it's not till the sword fate fight that I'm a hundred percent involved, but I do like that. Hey, how can we spice up a typical stormtrooper battle that, that worked for me? I just kept waiting for Ahsoka to look over at Ezra and say, Carl, <laughs> where's Carl? Carl. <laughs> um, but no, I, I, I enjoyed it too. It, it, it was fun seeing him come back. Um, and once again, I just, just slapped myself on the forehead and said, you just had to say something last week, didn't you, Matt? You just, you couldn't yeah. leave it alone. No green smoke, me. No well, we got green, green smoke today. I don't know what's going on there. Yeah. No, there were, here's the thing about that whole process, though, Bubba. Yeah. We didn't see, when we saw Maroc, we mm -hmm. saw everything leave him. With yep. those troopers last week, we didn't see anything leave them. So they no. obviously were still alive at the yeah, time. They so. weren't zombies. I, I think so these we guys saw were them alive actually, the first time. We saw the first time around, we actually yeah. saw them die. And then we saw them become reanimated by the green smoke going <laughs> in them. Uh, so I loved that. It, not quite as fancy green smoke as it was when with yeah. Maroc. I guess Maroc had a lot of it in him. Right. In the other galaxy, you had to use a lot more smoke. Here, here on, uh, you know, Paradia. You know, just a little smoke will do you. Yeah, and cool. we talked, you know, I talked earlier in this podcast about how there's certain storytelling devices and tricks that I don't like. Here's one that I do love. And we've already mentioned it. We mentioned earlier in the season about how Morgan Elsbeth, Bale and Skoll had different true agendas. They had their own agendas. You know, everybody's looking out for number one and how that added a dimensionality to the villains that I thought was great. I've kind of always suspected this. But here in episode eight, it becomes quite clear. Thrawn is telling Morgan she's got to go down with the ship. She's somebody has got to just, you know, slow him down even more so we can get out of here. Morgan, it's you. Thrawn gives what I assume is his catchphrase for the Empire. And Morgan, once he leaves, Morgan says, you know, her true allegiance is not to this Empire or Thrawn. She says for Dathomir. The great mothers are playing their own Game of Thrones here. Oh yes, um, everybody's yes. using everybody's using each other. Thrawn is mm -hmm. using them uh, so that he can be sure that he gets home, and so that he has something to to play with uh, weapon wise once he gets gets there. Mm -hmm. um, hence all the the coffins at the end. But uh, also the great we mothers are playing them because they need to get there, coffins. and they have their own type of. Uh, plan in place and I'm not yeah. sure exactly what that includes but I'm you know and because Morgan got left behind we'll never hear it from her um, as to what happened because she didn't evidently survive what happened we'll talk about that in a second but yeah she needed um, some green smoke can you make uh, your own green smoke I, I don't you know die? maybe she maybe she will come back who knows but yeah. it, it, but the thing is is yet at the end of a season Mm -hmm. um, not only do we not get answers to questions that we've been asking since season one, yeah. but we get yet another one. What is the great mother's plan? You know, are we going to yeah, find out in Mendo season four? Probably not. Mm, so maybe, maybe, I, I don't know, because I remember Favreau yeah. saying that he had already written season four. So right. I, um, I, although I would imagine that was about the same time that Ahsoka was filming. So, well, I'll, I'll make a not that bold prediction and say Mando season four. I think he's patrolling the outer edge of the galaxy, right? He's going to come across some of these forces. Uh, he's going to come across some of the stuff. I don't know if Dathomir is truly on the outer rim. I would assume it isn't, is not. But I don't recall. But he, he's going to get wind of this is what, uh, at the very least, what I would suspect. Yeah. 
But so it, these again, Thrawn evaluating them at the beginning to see what you know how much they would be tested by mm -hmm. whatever or to see what kind of powers they had um utilizing that power using them basically sending morgan to her death yep. for certain you know he's evaluating the great mothers and they in turn are evaluating him as well and so uh usually thrawn mm -hmm. as we know uh from the Re rebel series and from our you know, our legends canon or our legends knowledge. Um, Thrawn is very good at evaluating culture and figuring out how to best to exploit that. Um, so uh, it's going to be an interesting, it will be the thing you would think that brings Thrawn down in the end is these inner battles within his own organization. I would hope so, but it's also going to be our villains. Like it, it's going to be a mix. So let's talk about this rematch. And once again, I'm, because I enjoyed this fight so much and wasn't quite as engaged with the fight in Mandalorian season two between Morgan and Ahsoka, I was trying to think why. And it's maybe that a sword versus a staff, which was what was happening in season uh, two of the Mandalorian, wasn't as engaging. Or it could have been I'd really only known both those characters for one episode. And so yeah. I, they couldn't they couldn't have the animosity. They didn't really even know each other like they kind of knew of each other, but they hadn't had any battles. The fact yeah. that now Morgan and Ahsoka have had battles, they have had, you know, at the very least, even if they haven't a lot of had a lot of scenes together, they they have an animosity towards each other, which gives some emotion to it. And so not only was the choreography, I thought, incredible, but now these two characters have a lot of emotion and there's like emotion in this. Hey, I'm going to take this person out. And I, I just loved it. I think there might have been a, another reason that, it maybe seems more obvious now than it did at the time huh. uh, because we've seen Filoni approach this particular series very much from that samurai kind of approach, right? Yep, sure. And to me, Morgan and, and Ahsoka's first fight was very much that samurai measuring things up oh, kind yeah. of no, good thing, point. right? Yeah. So I, I think because that was Ahsoka's first live-action appearance, I think Filoni was – taking that theme that he already had in mind for Ahsoka mm -hmm. and presenting it there in that particular fight. Whereas here now, like you said, we know these characters are very well. We know what they're capable of to each other and apart from each other. And so it's a lot easier to skip the semantics of it and just move right on into uh, let's get down and get busy. <laughs> yeah, they were not sizing each other up. This was this is a fight to the death. Meanwhile, th this is a, a triangle or, or a, a, a triumph of heroes. We got to have Ezra and Sabine have something to do. They keep fighting stormtroopers, and later, I'm pretty sure they face death troopers who mm -hmm. just don't go down. Incredible! But the ship has taken off. We've got to do something. We've got to we've got to do a couple of things. First off, we got to pay off the moment that they've been building towards all season, and I think this wasn't as strong a payoff as I wanted. Sabine is in deep trouble. She's got this death trooper. She's got the stormtrooper choking her. She is going to die. In the absolute last moment, she pulls a lightsaber. Maybe because it was so foreshadowed, it didn't, and I mean foreshadowed, even though it probably happened a minute after we realized it was going to happen. I almost, maybe that didn't make it as powerful for me as possible, but she calls upon the force. Our 30-year-old 30 30 Padawan did it, Matt. What do you think about Sabine? Finally becoming touched with her midi chlorians. That moment of desperation reminds me an awful lot of Luke when he's hanging from the ice on Hoth. And the first oh, time yeah. that he pulls a lightsaber, you know, to his hand or the first time we see it. Right. Um, but all I could kept, kept thinking was, you know, I'll show that coffee cup. I'll show that coffee <laughs> cup. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the convenience of those kind of things, naturally this is Star Wars. So the convenience of things are going to happen. The force does have a will, but, at the same time, you know, this is the first time Sabine's been able to do this. I don't know if Luke has ever tried that before Hoth or not, but you know that his force ability has got to be multiple times stronger than hers. So it just right. seemed a little bit unbelievable to me that she could do that and then be able to, you know, throw Ezra like a football down all, you know, for a 70 yard pass. Oh, yes. After that. Yes, that felt like. So let's get to it. The ship is taken off. We got to get on the ship. You jump as far as you can with the force, and I'll push you the rest of the way. This, to me, 
the distance of it. And okay, this is live action. We got to accept some stuff. This to me reminded me of an animated show distance. Like in the animated show, they jump ridiculous distances all the time. We understand it's like a heightened look in animation. In live action, seeing how far it was that he was going to jump, even with a force push, you know, it was a bit tough for me. But yeah. it doesn't matter. Our heroes have to do it, or at least they need to do it to get to this end point. Ezra makes it. And the show, to the show's credit, once again, now that this sword fight is happening, I'm more engaged with the episode, really into it. Like, oh, what's going to happen? The show faked me out. Let me tip my cap to it. I really thought for a second Sabine was going to leave Ahsoka. And I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe you would do this. Like, the whole time, mm-hmm. this there's been one running theme this season. Actually, there's been a million running themes. But one of them has been what Hu Yang told those these guys earlier. Don't split up. And I thought Sabine was leaving Ahsoka. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. But yeah. it was a fake out. Thank goodness Sabine stayed behind. Ahsoka yeah. won. Morgan got diced. Ouch. This also feels a little bit like a forced character moment for me, this sudden turnaround. That's because uh, the Sabine that we've known the whole series, now, not in the Rebel series. Mm-hmm. Like, and, you know, I have more faith in, in the actual character of Sabine than this <laughs> series has projected. Okay. Uh, for people to have confidence in but everything that we had seen might have sh- made us suspect that she would uh that she was perfectly capable but we we have this character moment where she decides not to and then shows up and helps ahsoka out uh yep. which is a great you know fist pump moment if that's what you're looking for but for me again it felt a little forced <laughs> don't pardon the pun there thrawn who, once again, he's a Bond villain. He just stands around and makes decisions. So earlier, I thought maybe it was wrong. I thought I saw a shot of Thrawn saying, boy, this witch magic, oh, good grief. Here, Thrawn's like, okay, we got these evil Jedi down there on the temple that we're flying away from and leaving. Blast the Great Mother's Temple. To me, I thought the Great Mothers gave him some side eye, like, what, yep. you're going to blast our temple, you son of, yes, we're leaving this galaxy, but we don't want you to destroy our house as we leave. Right. Youch. That was not what I would have done if I was Thrawn. <laughs> but, um, you know, because they're on the bridge with him. It mm-hmm. wouldn't have taken anything for them to force magic him into something green as right. opposed or to ha- something or how blue. About say, how about tell him, ladies, you may love some of the wonderful tea and coffee and biscuits we've laid out. Why don't you go enjoy them? Uh, go, 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 great yeah. mothers, go, great mothers. Yeah. Okay. Now that they're gone, bow up there. No, he just says it in front of him. He don't. He gives no forces. Yeah, he gives no forces. He's, he he should have sent them to the green room and, <laughs> the and green smoke uh, room. Then yeah. carried out his order. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so we we got to end the episode on a chase. We've had fights. We've had battles. Now it's a chase. Ahsoka is trying to catch the eye of Scion. Thrawn drops a wonderful line that I put here in the show notes. And they have a bunch of these lines. Part of me wonders, God, I hope they pay off for all these lines. But Thrawn, he's like, he knows that Ahsoka was Anakin's Padawan. And he, he's talking about Ahsoka. He goes, one wonders just how similar you might become. He, talking to her. Dang, ow, ice cold. Yeah, that it, it, you love ice cold disses. And this do. was a pretty good one. So good. Let me ask you, let's just pause between the recap here. Do you think we'll ever see a moment where Ahsoka might be making the same mistakes that Anakin did? In in this season, next season, the movie, do you think Ahsoka would ever get as close or go mm-hmm. as far as Anakin did? Wow. There are some that might say might question whether she hasn't already, but I Whoa. I, I mean, it's just in a matter of interpretation of how strict you believe in the Jedi code and what have you not because there have been moments where uh, uh, um, I think that you could you've seen in the Clone Wars and in Rebels where attachment has kind of gotten the better of Ahsoka, and you have to wonder, given the ending of this episode, if she's still following Force Ghost Anakin around, what's he going to tell her? Hopefully, he's learned his lesson before he tells her anything. But yeah. I, I don't see it being anything so dark that it makes us even dislike her for a moment. We might worry for her, but we won't dislike her. Well, yeah, I mean, let let's hope not. They don't get there. We end up in this bizarre scenario, and there's more to talk about, but Eye of Scion makes it out. Ahsoka, Sabine, Huyang, they're trapped. What are you going to do? You're just going to go back to Pridia. 
set up camp with the Nodi and just almost kind of smile and say, yeah, all right, well, we did what we, we, you know, we made the right choice. We did what we thought we could do. In fact, Ahsoka says the line to Sabine, you did well at the very end of the episode. Mm. And I'm like, she did well. No, she did terribly. <laughs> this is the, this is almost the worst thing that could happen. Yes. You rescued one person, Ezra. But when the whole fate of your galaxy is in trouble, I think she did terrible. And then Ahsoka also has this this double whammy of a line. She says, Ezra's where he needs to be, and so are we. I'm like, what? What, what planet are you on? We need to be on a desolate planet in a different galaxy with no way to get home? No, oh, brother. Um, so I did jump past some stuff that we'll go back and talk, but... Matt, any thoughts about where our heroes, Ahsoka and Sabine, end up in season one? I kind of really love where Ahsoka is in terms of her being at peace with all of it. Okay, because, I do love that. I do love that. I, okay, um, I'm, I'm with you in that. And, and she's got reason to be. She's mm-hmm. seen Morai, her owl, um, <laughs> and yes. she has uh, seen Anakin, her master. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think that she feels like that she can overcome whatever it is they need to overcome. Um, I love that despite all of the, the strife that went on in this particular episode, Ahsoka never lost her upbeatness. She got serious, but she never really yeah. lost her upbeatness. She never got down on any other aspect right. of it. Um, so that's a great growth for this character over the course of the season. Um, Sabine, uh, yeah, still pangs of guilt there. I hope they don't, should. Let, they, there should and, be. and there should be probably, but I hope that they don't last too long. I hope that ah- Ahsoka can reassure her uh, that, uh, you know, everything's going to according to the way that the Force wills it, if nothing else. There you go. And I I think that Sabine actually saw uh, Anakin as well. Do you? Because when Ooh, she said it's a shadow in, in the light, I think that she saw a little bit of Anakin because then it, Ahsoka was looking in that same direction and she saw him, obviously. I wonder, I, I didn't go, I wouldn't go that far in my interpretation, Matt, but possibly. As Force Ghost Anakin, and Anakin in general, has really had more of a presence in this, this series than I ever thought he could. Right. Any thoughts on that? Do you assume that if we go to season two, and if this is, you know, the basis for the wrap-up movie, is Anakin really, you know, is this is he a big part of season two and the movie and, and the whole story? Force well, Ghost Anakin? Yeah, see, it's the thing that in the original series and even in the uh, the sequel, we couldn't get. We couldn't get a um, a Hayden playing a young Anakin uh, it, it being a guide, the person who was responsible for balancing the Force. So I love the fact that they're going to use Hayden as Anakin, uh, as the kind of the avatar for ahsoka the same way that obi-wan was for luke throughout the sequels or the the originals hmm. yeah we'll see listeners i've asked a lot of questions to matt no when i ask matt i also want your opinion at double phq on all social media what do you think is anakin truly kind of a, a linchpin of this story going forward yeah please now, let us know because my takes are crap Thank you for saying it. <laughs> um, let's get you two characters who, because this action, this episode had so much action in it, I kind of lost track of them, and maybe the show did too. Shin. Shin didn't return to Thrawn at all. She's got the rawest deal of all. Like, admittedly, our galaxy, the galaxy we've known and love, is probably have a, has a terrible consequence of this season. But imagine you're Shin. You are following your Padawan along. He brings you to another galaxy. As I mentioned last week, right before a fight, he's like, peace out later, loser. Yeah. You go out, you lose the fight. The, your ride home to your galaxy just left without you. And so you're like, what am I going to do? Well, I guess these people might take me in, the people who helped me lose my battle. <laughs> hey, fellow losers, I'm here in your camp. Any thoughts on Shin, who to me... If she's going to have any story, she's got to she's got to somehow unite with the good guys. Yeah, that's a funny thing because Shin, I don't think uh, went last week. I thought, well, she's trying to get back to the ship before it takes yeah. off. I don't think that's what she did at all. No, um, obviously, I think not. she obviously. Well, I mean, she because she would have gotten there before 
um, Ahsoka and them did. You would assume. Well, they sat around just hovering over the Nodi for like two Well, days. maybe the Nodi ship passed her and she was on foot. And then they hopped on Howlers. And so that's how they, you know, like she was like, I got to hoof it on foot the whole way back. This blows. It seemed like she'd been galloping the whole time since the time she left. Yeah. Um, but I think that, you know, what we learned about Shin is her need for power, her need for control. And she's found a group of people that she can have power okay. and control because she'd already worked with them once before um, or these nomads or whatever. Um, so she'd Shin, definitely be a foil for our characters, you know, if during season two or Mando chapter 39 or something like that. Well, hold on. Let's pause there for a second, Matt, if you don't mind. If you're Shin, yes, you hate Ahsoka. You tried to kill her and Sabine, but you were doing that for a boss. What if you don't have that job anymore? Do you still want to kill Ahsoka and Sabine? Or do you like, well, you know, it was kind of my old job and I don't do that anymore. She had, she had that opportunity to bury that hatchet last week. Well, she Bubba. still had the boss last week. The boss and the job hadn't taken off for the original galaxy last week. Last week, you know, as I thought, she could go back to the boss and hop on the starship again. Yeah. That's now true. that's gone. The, you know, the, the job has left you. You didn't leave the job. The job left you. So I don't know. That's another she question. She tends listeners. to embrace more sense, more uh, Sith kind of sensibilities, double yeah. S. So <laughs> I would say that revenge is probably much more uh, on her mind uh, than, you know, smoking a peace pipe. Let me say that this is something that, thank God, we are deep into the podcast. And only people who truly know us are listening at this point, not any newbies. But there's that meme, or there's always a meme online anytime there's a bad boy on a TV show or a movie uh, that some girl uh, or woman, excuse me, sends out where she's like, I can fix him. You know, that bad boy, I can fix him. I look at Shin and I want to do that meme of, you know, like, I can fix her. <laughs> oh, my. I can help her. I can change her. <laughs> Shin, I, one of my favorite characters, I, hooray that Shin survives. You just lost a, a longtime listener in me. I'm going to get off this podcast. You keep saying stuff like that. Shin is evil. I can change. Her. <laughs> All she needs is the support of somebody who's not going to leave her in another galaxy. So let's Bubba, get you know her. What we can't change. You know what, what we can't change. And that's the fact that Ourselves. Balin just wants to stand around on statues and dream. Oh, my Lord, dude, dude, you Balin has a mission. The show, as I said, did a storytelling device I hate. Didn't bother to tell us that mission after eight episodes. But he is there. He is on a Lord of the Rings type giant statue place. And even me, somebody who didn't watch the animated shows, I still, you know, get enough of this kind of father, son, and daughter talk that I realized really only for the father, the son, you know, I wouldn't have put that together if, if the father statue didn't look so much like the father statue that is kind of a meme itself out there. Yeah. And you well, see the, he's on the father's arm and like the father's arm is pointing forward or maybe just, you know, maybe it's not pointing, but it's like, it's on an oh, outstretched sure. arm. Yeah. yeah. And he's on it. This is, this was his goal. This, wherever he's going, it's where he wanted to go. Balin, you know, he wanted to do what he wanted to do, and he's headed that way. Thoughts on the father and son statues, Matt? Well, there was there was the daughter statue was there too. It was his to his left. Yeah, it but just, you can see it in the clip, but it head, doesn't look man. like it's complete, or it looks Dude, like it the face have is head. small. Or, yeah, the, it's the way the face is there to me, it looked like the face had been uh, destroyed. I'm gonna have to look at that image. Yeah, defa it might have been defaced. Um, mm -hmm. it, that would make sense. When we think about what the Night Sisters are and how uh, their magic is related primarily to dark side magic, because the sun is a representation of the dark side, whereas the daughter really? is a representation of the light side. And mm -hmm. then the father is, of course, a balance. Um, so sure. uh, I think whatever power it is that uh, just go ahead and throw this theory out there, because why not? We've got two years for people to call me wrong. Uh, I think the thing that Balin <laughs> is looking for is that combination of light and dark. I think he's trying to end the struggle between Sith and Jedi, between light and dark. He's trying to find what true balance is, the thing that Anakin supposedly restored, even though, uh, I, as is evidenced by the sequel series, um, that's not necessarily the case. Right. So, uh, 
I think he is seeking that balance. Um, and so it makes sense that he's embracing these things. The thing, other thing that I think is so important yes. is the fact that if these characters, these statues, these representations of these sides of the force are here, then this is a universal thing. We are in another galaxy far, far farther and further away than mm -hmm. we were before. And we've seen this introduced in the animated series in our regular far, far away galaxy. So what I love is, is the fact that if this is happening here, then it's likely happening everywhere or that this is the origin place of all of this. Mm. Mm. Well, that is fascinating. Maybe, uh, maybe just saying it like that though, Matt, does make it so frustrating that we didn't get further along with it. So do you think, and I guess the only answer is, is that they're going to have to recast, aren't they? This, this great actor, we've mentioned it all season long, Ray Stevenson passed, but you can't just have Balin Skull. Well, I mean, actually you could, I'm already thinking of story ways. You could say, Oh, okay, this is how they would be uh, different. And uh, this is how they could explain it. But you, you never see his face. He goes for whatever it is. It goes for, it blows up. And suddenly he's somebody different because he's been disfigured. Or, or Shin later comes across a dead body that you quickly realize it's Balin Skull or, or um, mm. Ahsoka and Sabine do. So there are ways that, you know, here I said, there's they're, no way. They're going to do the Chris Pratt dummy stuff and she's going to carry him, uh, yeah. uh, carry his body to somewhere to burn. Yeah. Totally could. Totally could. We're not done yet because we do see the eye of Sion outside Dathomir. So we know that's where they're going. Yep. And in a scene that I some ways kind of appreciate in other ways, I hated it. I appreciate we see that Ezra shows up at the new Rus new Republic fleet, how he found them specifically. Let's ignore that part of it, but he found the new Republic's fleet chopper and Hera reunite with Ezra. This is so wonderful. And then there's one, there's one thing that just didn't make any sense. You are flying to the new Republic fleet. You fly into their hangar bay. You come out of the spaceship and you're still wearing the star the stormtrooper helmet. Yeah. Are you nuts, dude? What is the point of this? This is for TV sake only. It doesn't right. make any, you know, it. I, 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 I get that it's a bit of a callback to the very first episode where a new Republic f a right. ship took on a Imperial vessel like this. But I mean, oh my Lord, that drove me nuts. Yeah. So the other thing that it does for me is it gives, you know, I've been clamoring for an answer uh, about how Ezra survived that star trip to Peridia on mm. this spaceship. And we saw him, well, he just simply knocked a, a stormtrooper out and then uh, hid in his uniform during the whole time. The question is, is how did, as because at the end of Rebels, yeah. he is on the bridge. Thrawn is on the bridge. The Pergil yeah, yeah, are the, actually... The, the windows have been blown out, The right? windows have been blown out. How did he survive all of that? So mm -hmm. that's that's the question. Um, but in terms of him being able to hide out during the rest of the trip, I guess we did get our answer that way because he did the same thing coming back. Dude, dude, Thrawn, if you allowed that, because it feels like that trip takes several hours, right? This is not a, a quick I think trip. several days. Yeah, you know, Thrawn, how did you... Uh, Thrawn, you've officially made the list of troublemaker. <laughs> you've got to be better, Thrawn. I demand it. Just lower his uh, IQ a little bit for me as well. All right. Well, let's let's get to it. That's the end of this episode, end of the season. Any final thoughts, Matt, before we, you know, like uh, the show, disappear for two years, at least talking about this. We will be talking about Skeleton Crew. We will be talking about the Acolyte and possibly and or two next year. What are your thoughts about how we wrapped up Ahsoka? For all of the kind of strange storytelling choices that they made for the course of this series. Let's not forget that. And, and what I hope is that it doesn't have bad ramifications on him as we go forward. But, um, this is outside of directing and, and running animated things where you can just draw whatever the heck you want. Yes. I don't think there's anything wrong with Dave Filoni's storytelling abilities, but I think he does need to do some tightening up in terms of, uh, writers, 
in terms of his own writing and in terms of maybe the way that he plots things out. And I expect season two of Ahsoka, which will come out eventually some point before a movie does, uh, I expect it to be much better, much improved, because he does seem to be a guy who has a really good learning curve and, and learns from his mistakes and, and improves upon them. We've seen that with individual episodes of The Mandalorian and his directorial stuff. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I, I haven't lost faith in this show at all simply because it was a weird spot to leave a finale. I just no. think, you know, I, I'm ready for more. So I'm happy about that. Okay. I think in this is a, a call out listeners. Once again, search on your podcast app of choice, bust in blockbusters. But I think just a bit how the wheel of time got even better in season two. I think Ahsoka, which I gave a B to as a non-animated show watcher, I think it can improve and season two yeah. can be even better. So I am definitely not, I, I know I always kind of talk about the things that didn't quite work for, for me and hopefully the things that did like that great sword battle. I do think the show can get even better. So I know a lot of people love it now. I think it can get better. I think there are some people who maybe are more like me and found it a bit sluggish. Once again, I would not bail on this show at anyway. I'm not selling my stock. I'm keeping my Ahsoka stock, Matt. I agree. Okay. Now though, it's time to play our final round of Jedi or not a Jedi. Just like Ahsoka is not a Jedi, but teaches the Jedi way and kind of is a Jedi in all intents and name, but maybe she's not a Jedi. We go through characters and situations here on Ahsoka and find out, are they Jedi or not a Jedi? So Matt, let's go to the green smoke in the room. We've got zombie night troopers. They are resurrected with magic. Is that a form of the force? Zombie night troopers. Jedi, not a Jedi. Let's hear your thoughts. Okay. Uh, I got to really think about this from a couple of different perspectives, Bubba, because sure. sometimes you just wish they were, they and their ways, which is zombify them, would, would just stay dead, right? <laughs> okay, sure. But then again, Luke in The Last Jedi also thought that the Jedi and the Jedi ways should just stay dead after he's gone. So I would say that the, Nor- the night troopers are definitely Jedi. You know what? What happens when Jedi die? True Jedi. They're, you know, their earthly flesh and bones kind of fade away into the force. What happens when a night trooper dies? Green smoke comes out. And so it's close enough. You are correct, Matt. The night the zombie death troopers are definitely Jedi. Okay, let's let's go a bit crazy here. Uh, we've got these two statues and maybe a third, the daughter. So the father, the son, and the daughter. I know they are kind of uh, uh, an aspect of the force. Maybe you should explain what they are first. But do you consider the father and the son and the daughter, are they Jedi or not a Jedi? What is your thoughts there? Wow, the daughter, I, I, it, it's this is weird, Bubba, because I think okay. you've got a mixed bag here. I think sure. that you have the father who represents yeah. the balance of the force. Have you ever known a balanced Jedi? I have not. So Hmm. therefore the father cannot be Jedi. Um, The son. Now, the son, from my recollection of the Clone Wars series, is arrogant, very sure in his ways, does questionable things. So definitely a Jedi. Absolutely a Jedi. It has to be. Right. There's no way. Yeah, sure. Uh, And then you have the mother, or uh, pardon me, the daughter. The, yeah, daughter. the daughter, the daughter, never oh. met the mother as tip as is typical. The mother, it's Shmi Skywalker, Shmi is the mother, has but... been, uh, Shmi has been cast aside yet again. <laughs> now, does. um, the, the daughter actually sacrifices herself to save Ahsoka in a way. Um, her essence is placed in Ahsoka and that's why Mirai, which is a representation of the daughter follows her around. Mm-hmm. Oh yes. So, um, Jedi following people around, they never do that. They're always in the lead. They're always <laughs> insisting that they're correct. So the yeah. daughter, not a Jedi. You know what? You were correct, except on the daughter. What happens at the beginning of the Phantom Menace? Two Jedi follow around Jar Jar Binks. Right? Um, what? Okay. I mean, right? What happens when Qui-Gon goes to the village in Tatooine, Mos Espa? 
this kid. He's like, hey, there's a storm coming. Come with me to my house. Qui-Gon follows him. The, all of them are Jedi. I, I'm I'm four for four. All the characters we've debated this week are Jedi. Okay. Okay. Sabine. Well, uh, the, let me ask you this one, Boba, oh, because sure, I sure. want to hear yeah. your opinion first. Uh, what about Mandalorians? Are yes. they Jedi or not Jedi? Quite simply, Jedi. What happened to the Jedi in Order 66, Matt? They were extinguished. What happened to the Mandalorians on the Night of a Thousand Tears? They were extinguished. Jedi, you nailed it. No debate. Yeah. Let's hear I, you. But I have an, I agree with you completely, okay, especially on that point. But I want to add yeah. additional point, and that is oh. that no matter what, after this extinguishing, this extinction event, right. more and more of them just keep popping up out of nowhere. <laughs> yes, that's very... Oh. So definitely Jedi, for sure. Matt, we are, so, we are so close. We've been right every time. So this final one, though, for the season, I call it the Force Owl. What do you, this animal, what do you call it, and is it a Jedi? Uh, Morai, there is a name for this particular species, and I sure. apologize. Uh, it's time for animation fans to really get mad at me for not knowing this. No, but no. I don't know, so that's why I call it the Force Owl. Okay. Um, to me, Morai, let's see, very protective, yep. overlooking assists ahsoka sometimes of course um so not possibly a jedi because jedi no. never assisted anybody oh man you were so close matt uh -oh. Uh oh so close listen now, this i'm is, gonna get peed on me now aren't i this is this is it, right you have been canceled because what do we know about the morai from another show we podcasted about here on double phq twin peaks the morai are not what they seem Jedi, there you go. <laughs> Listeners, we haven't had anybody vote on any of our debates on whether it's a Jedi or not. Maybe because you know it's too silly. But hopefully you've enjoyed us being a bit lighter here at the end of the episode, talking about some odd silliness here in the world of Star Wars. Matt, let's leave this silliness and let's get to some serious. You have been almost a Padawan to Kevin Kiner's musical score, or his master at times saying, listen, Padawan, you should be doing this. What are you going to be this week? Are you going to be a Padawan or a Jedi master talking about this wonderful score? Well, particularly for this episode, I heard a little whisper from Counter Melodies. Oh. And they told me that just like many of the answers posed in this series that we thought mm -hmm. might get answered right. in this episode, they were completely left out. And oh, so no. Counter Melodies also feel completely left out. So that's what I'm going to do this time around. How counter melodies amp up the themes that we already know. This is a long segment, folks. If you uh, don't want to listen to seven minutes and 40 seconds of it, skip ahead. Well, I'm still feeling a little bit confused about the ending and a little bit disappointed in the ending of this season. I was not disappointed with the ending music from Kevin Kiner at all i thought it was brilliant stuff especially just the last few minutes right on through to the end credits which changed a little bit it changed from that minor beginning uh, to being a really wonderful version of the ahsoka theme all the way through but the ending scenes themselves leading right up to when we see anakin were really nicely scored and i just want to go through a couple of those points before I do, do want to point out we got just a little bit of the Thrawn melody that we talked about before. We also got a little bit of the Balin melody that I talked about last week. And we also got a little bit of Hera's theme as her and Ezra were reunited. I've already talked about all that stuff either in the season or in my preview podcast, so I'm going to leave those alone. But I am going to talk about just a couple of things that happened at the end of this episode that were things that we had discussed before. It begins with Ahsoka and Sabine, that last scene of them with the Noti. And as Ahsoka tells Sabine that she did well, we hear a little bit of her theme. There's a couple of interesting things about this. Uh, let me just play for you what it sounded like.
first of all, I love that little pause before the phrase is completed. It's almost like Sabine taking a breath to see if Ahsoka is judging her or not. But something else that's happening on top there resolves that question for us musically. That top line that I played on top of the melody there, that's what we call a counter line or a counter melody. And oftentimes, it will help tell the story as well. In this case, what we had was the first note of that was what we call the suspension. What a suspension does is it makes a chord be able to resolve either major or minor because that third note isn't present. Instead, it's raised up to the fourth step so that once it resolves, it can give us a clearer definition of how to feel about it. And in this case, it did resolve to major. So that tells us that everything is going to be okay between Sabine and Ahsoka. The better use, in my opinion, of counter melodies was shortly after that going on with Ahsoka's theme. Now, just to refresh your memory, Ahsoka's theme normally sounds like this. There's some really cool stuff happening here because what Kiner does is he actually puts the melody down at the bottom. Usually the melody soars over the harmony or is embedded within the harmony. But here, the melody itself is the bass. And you can accentuate other emotions by adding a counter line on top of it. And we got that. And actually what that did was that set up a slight reharmonization as well. So listen to the counter melody on top and how the harmony underneath changes just a little bit on the last note. Now, why was that counter melody important? Well, for one thing, rhythmically, it's set up where that harmony would predictably go because that harmony is from the force theme by John Williams and that triplet rhythm that is in that counter melody is exactly the same triplet rhythm that is in the force melody. It's a clever little trick to allude to a theme that isn't actually there, but if you're a Star Wars fan or a John Williams fan at all, you instantly recognize that connection. Loved it. And then, at the very end, as Ahsoka is looking towards the hill and she is actually seeing Anakin, after Sabine thought that she had... We get a wonderful version of Ahsoka's theme without leaving the key, but changing the place where the melody starts. We're staying in this key right here. But instead, that becomes the first note, whereas before it was on the third of the chord, the third of the minor chord. Now it is no longer that. And he adjusts the intervals, meaning the distance between the notes, accordingly. So what we get is a major sound as opposed to that typical Ahsoka minor sound. And it sounds like this. Love those little reharmonizations in there. Everything about this was just absolutely perfect. Right down to the ending. There's a little trick that composers sometimes do. One of the most effective is to use the flat 6 chord to the major 1. You don't have to worry about these numbers. All it is is that a flat 6 chord can normally imply that it is going to a minor, and then you can get tricked into feeling happier at the end or resolved at the end because it goes to a major. This is slightly different. 
there is a note that is in common, and that is the minor third, which would be a G against an E chord. But the full major chord of the G chord resolving to an E creates a little bit different energy. It's not quite so harsh as going from that flat six chord. Going from the flat three chord feels a little more inevitable that it's going to be major. And I loved it. It was the perfect ending before we got into those final credits, which I'm not going to talk about here because I'm already way out of time. But I'm going to leave you with this lovely ending. And we'll be back with Bubba in just a second. Matt, that may have only been seven minutes and 40 seconds, but it flew by. Thank you so much. Brilliant insight as always. And now for people who also have brilliant insight, let's go to our listeners with double L loyal listener feedback. And in fact, we have had consistent feedback from some people. So instead of Jedi, not a Jedi, let's hear it for Camille at Harley Camille, who's always a great source of knowledge on all Star Wars show, but I think she's been great on this Ahsoka show. Matt, before we get to Camille's feedback, would you say Camille is a Jedi Master, a Padawan, a Knight Sister, or a Nodi? What would you, where would you put Camille oh at Harley Camille? Well, Jedi Master, of course, Camille, yes, thank because she you. is definitely, you know, she's one of our most mastering double L's that we've ever had. I agree. Jedi Master for Harley Camille. What was her feedback this week, Matt? Uh, well, she actually gave this episode nine out of ten double L's. Wait, double L's? Yeah, lots of lightsabers. Oh, Love yes. the lightsaber action. Zombie yes. stormtroopers are creepy. Yes. Happy Ezra is home. Bummed that others are not. Took mm. off one point for the cliffhanger that we will have to wait forever to find oh, out yes. what happens next. Yes. The, these two-year breaks between shows, we talk about it on so many shows we podcast about. House of the Dragon. Uh, Andor's going to have a two-year break. The Mandalorian just had a two-year break. This is tough. We got this feedback on YouTube from George, who really heard us saying, hey, give us some comments down in the YouTube comments. And so George wrote this. He writes on a, our Only Murders in the Building podcast and some of our other shows, too, on YouTube. George just said... I got to watch this. That's four words. Make that. And he wrote four more words. Wait, no. Now I've written seven words. And he goes, now I've written 11, maybe 14. George, thank you so much for checking this out. And if you're watching this podcast or listening to this podcast without seeing Ahsoka, I can say, as someone who didn't watch the animated shows, it is enjoyable. It's not like going to be, for me, it hasn't been an A-plus show, but it's been a solid B with moments of A stuck into it. So, George, if you're listening to these podcasts without watching Ahsoka, check it out. I agree, George. And also, you're you're very bright because that joke went right over my head until I started <laughs> counting the words in your comment. Um, yes. So, thank you so much for doing that. Love it. Another great feedback person, Laura McMillian at Mesocat on Twitter. She is a Greg either. Let's hear it, Matt. Is she a Jedi Master, a Padawan, a Night Sister? Is she a Green Smoke <laughs> Night Trooper? Is she Chopper? What are your thoughts? Where is she uh, the president of the New Republic, like Mon Mothma? Where do you put wonderful listener Laura McMillian? Well, Bubba, I'm you know, I think that Laura and Camille both should be offended that you would even use their names and Night Sister in the same sentence. The Night Sisters are powerful, man. I'm saying these listers are powerful. I, I you know, baby, okay. They're a bit, maybe the Night Sisters are a bit pale. I'm a well, bit Well, and pale, as badly you know? as I talk about the Jedi, maybe right. Camille should be very upset that I called her a Jedi Master. <laughs> yeah, uh, but I'm also going to call Laura a Jedi Master because okay. I think both of these two... Uh, I would be their Padawan. They have great thoughts That's about Star true. Wars. Mm -hmm. So uh, Laura says, this episode is a great ending to a great season. I look forward to season two. I assume this will be continued somehow. <laughs> there is a lot of Mortis hinted at here. Is this is that maybe the reason Thrawn was so anxious to leave Peridia? Mortis. Oh, now that is a great question, Excellent. Matt. Now, I, I as a non-animated show watcher, my knowledge of Mortis is kind of, sort of, not so great. How would you answer Laura's Jedi Master question there? 
Well, thanks for pinning me in the corner, Bubba, because to be honest, Mortis uh, is something that is not registering with me right now. It's probably just the heat from this Ahsoka headpiece and uh, cape that I'm wearing right now. Uh, (laughs) But I'm honestly drawing a blank. Do you know anything about Mortis? Well, I thought Mortis had something to do. Was that the planet where the where the father, the son and the daughter were? Oh, okay. That's probably it. That's probably it. So there, I, I agree with you then, Laura, because uh, I said earlier that, you know, I believe that the land of Mordor that Balaam was looking oh, yeah. over definitely has something to do uh, with the father, son, and daughter. And the I think he's seeking the balance of the force, whatever that is. He's going to find – it makes perfect sense that Anakin would be there to be perfectly well, honest, since he is the one who brought balance to the force. Well, here, as somebody who kind of is trying to put this together in my own head, maybe there's one of these type of planets in every galaxy where you can really connect with the force. Maybe Mortis is in our traditional galaxy and Pretty is in this one. I, You know, who's to say? I, I'm getting very confused. Now, Matt, we reached out on X Twitter on your Twitter account, and you had a great poll. Why don't you tell people what the results of people's thoughts are? Yeah, we just simply asked if they liked this Ahsoka finale or not. Mm-hmm. And we basically put it in four categories. Absolutely and completely liked it. Yep. It was good, but not perfect. Mm. I'm kind of met on it mm. and not much to like or mm. your four choices because you only get four choices on X yes. Twitter. Also, our sample size is a little small, but we got 170 votes on wonderful the, on the. Now Deca, let me ask you something. Deca let me ask Twitter. you something. So, once again, this is immediately has the episode been out 24 hours? It has not been out 24 hours, so we don't have a, a huge vote on this. But looks like 18 percent are absolutely and completely happy with the finale. So. Do you think people, when they see finale, they think this specific episode, or do you think they mean the season as a whole? I think they mean this episode. And so 18% say it's absolutely and completely perfect. Another 53% say, you know, good. To me, 18 plus 53, I should be able to do the math. That's 71. Is that more than 71? <laughs> yeah, that's close. Yeah, 70, 71. Right, here we go. Who said there'd be math involved? 71% people enjoyed this finale. That's pretty good. Now, I voted <laughs> I voted because I was uh, torn between good or meh, and I voted on the mess column, so I am one of the 18% who were kind of meh. But then there were 12%, and I bet this is really all about the cliffhangers because pe- there are a certain group of people who aren't liking the idea of a cliffhanger for two seasons, and there were 12% of those. So that's 18 plus 12. I can do that math. Uh, about 30% who are down. Right. So w- what it is is you rounded them all up, Bubba. And <laughs> no, so because we have it is percentages, 30, right. you need to round. Even if they're higher than 0.5, sometimes you got to round them down to make it work out. Okay. Because so you I ended up, up with a total of 101%. That doesn't add up. These go to 11. So do you think that's it, Matt? Do you think it's it's the cliffhanger nature of this that that got us 11.8% of people saying not much to like? Yeah, um, I think that part of the expectations, and again, this is where I failed on on being able to reason hmm. with. Okay. Uh, I think that the expectations were extremely high, given that we had a pretty darn good episode in the penultimate. Yeah. And uh, because some of those expectations were let down a little bit because of unanswered questions uh, that had been drilled into our brains all season long. Um, I guess Filoni's plan here was to drill them in our heads so much that we'll hang on to them for season two, but uh, it doesn't seem like a very good plan to me. Uh, At any rate, I think that, yeah, uh, the lack of answers and the letdown of expectations to get those answers and maybe to get something a little more out of Thrawn uh, probably lowered lowered this episode's quality for some of these people. All right, let me say that if you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe to it. I mentioned on this podcast feed how many of these upcoming Star Wars shows are in the pipe. There are three that we can speak about in the pipe, and that doesn't even include Mando Season 4 or Ahsoka Season 2. Subscribe because we want you on this journey with us. 
for everybody here at the Parsec Passion Podcast. My name's Bubba. You can find me on all social media apps at Fitten Trim. That's my middle name, Fitten, F-I-T-T-E-N-T-R-I-M, at Fitten Trim on social media. And I am Ahsoka the Walter White, and well, you can find that. me look on social that. media at Musical Concepts. Man, what is the blue meth of the force? <laughs> is that the sun? The sun is the blue meth. Not if, the blue if you're meth not on YouTube, universe. if you're not it's the seeing blue the milk. video. Oh, that's a good point. If you're not on YouTube, Ahsoka the White Walter is uh, is hilarious. So anyway, you'll talk to us next time on Pause. Passion. Just